I get the privilege of uh, presenting this project for the second year in a row. Last year, if you were here, Eric Werner uh, gave an update on the first year, year and a half of the effort. Uh, we're here to um, talk about what's happened in the last year. Um, my name is Scott McMillan, and I'm with the Emerging Technology Center. So I'll give you the bottom line up front. Um, Fast and efficient graph analytics is important and pervasive. Um, and at the same time, heterogeneous hardware, very complicated to program, is already here. Um, we have built a library that helps developers use both. So we're talking about uh, programmability and performance measures in assured design that John Goodenough talked about earlier today. And um, we've built that library to answer our research question is whether or not we can define a set of primitives and operations um, that can separate the concerns between the complexity of developing graph analytics and the complexity of programming these ever increasingly complicated hardware architectures. Um, so I'll go into a bit of motivation for both of those aspects, both graph analytics and the hardware. And I'll talk about our solution in terms of the separation of concerns. Uh, and before I get started, I'll just give a brief uh, review of what a graph is. Um, graphs consist of nodes and edges. They're a fundamental data structure in computer science. Uh, the nodes can be anything like um, people in a social network or computers in a uh, computer network. Uh, the edges could be connections between those people, like a friend network, or connections in a computer network, a communication pattern, whatever. There's a, a great amount of complexity that you can build into graphs. Um, there are a number of ways to represent graphs. In the upper right-hand corner, there's the um, adjacency list that's taught in most undergraduate courses. Um, that so the, the left column of the adjacency list are the vertices, and then there's a linked list to their neighbors. You can also represent it as a sparse matrix, and that's the lower right. That's the adjacency matrix. Um, a fundamental operation that you perform on graphs is breadth first traversal. So if you say start at node one, in the first uh, ply of the traversal, you can reach nodes two and four. In the second ply, you can reach nodes three, five, and seven, and so on and so forth. Uh, that operation plays into a lot of algorithms that are used in graph analytics. Um, this is the slide that John Goodenough showed this morning. Uh, graph analytics is pervasive, especially in computer network security, social network analysis, optimization, and planning. Um, underlying those analytics are a, a trove of graph algorithms, from community detection to clustering to shortest path discovery, uh, centrality measures to find important nodes in a network. In 2013, uh, the NRC um, released a report called Massive Data Analysis that basically said that uh, graph algorithms and creating efficient ones are, are very difficult to do but very important. The reason why they're difficult is they have small computation to communication ratio, and they essentially have unpredictable access into memory. You can't use cache hierarchies in the standard hardware architectures to hide the access to memory. You can't use the computation to hide access into memory. Um, and more recently, with the, the executive order to create the National Strategic Computing Initiative, it's no longer about existential computing performance. It's no longer about a uh, number of operations that you can do in a second. It's also about exascale data. So let's talk about the hardware. Um, so I talked about the computing performance. The, the most powerful supercomputer in the world is in China. It has millions of CPU cores but it also has accelerators associated with them, the Xeon Phi. Number two on that list right now uses NVIDIA GPUs, graphics processing units, as accelerators. Um, these are extremely complicated hardware architectures to program. You even have one in your pocket if you're walking around with an iPhone 6. 
It has an A8 multi-core processor, it has a multi-core GPU, and it has a motion processor. Our focus in this work has been with GPUs. Um, so parallelism today, or performance today, is achieved with parallelism. Uh, parallelism is a different kind of programming. Uh, another NRC report says that you need software abstractions to help with this programmability hurdle. Um, so let's talk about the development of a library that helps with both of these. So in graph analytics today, the state of the art is researchers who want to publish a paper um, need to develop uh, a very efficient graph algorithm, and it's usually the, the canonical graph algorithm is breadth first search. That's also what the benchmarks uh, track. They need to be experts in graph analytics to get this done. They also need to become experts in whatever hardware that they have. So every research paper is almost a one off approach. Um, enter. HPEC 2013. 19 of the leading graph analytics experts in the research community got together and said, we need an abstraction layer to separate the concerns of graph algorithm development, hardware development. Um, they say that a linear algebraic approach is the way to go. Uh, at about the same time as this came out, we uh, started collaborating with one of them in the middle, Andrew Lumsden at Indiana University. Uh, he's the director of the Center for Research in Extreme Scale Technologies. He's a, a, a well-known leader in graph analytics, and his team has the hardware expertise as well. And this is the software architecture. It uh, is similar to the um, graph analytics expertise above the separation concerns, um, and the hardware expertise below the separation concerns. So graph analytic applications, uh, we want developers of them to not have to be worried about hardware architectures. So the separation concerns is to shield them from hardware architecture uh, changes. Um, we'll talk about the uh, effort to find that API in a second. But on top of that, they also need algorithms developed in terms of those, that API. Below the separation concerns, we need experts developing whatever primitives we come up with tuned for uh, the hardware architectures. Now, this is similar to what was done about 40 years ago in the scientific computing uh, world when the BLAS standardization effort uh, took place. BLAS stands for Basic Linear Algebra Subprograms. Um, this was used to measure the performance of supercomputers back in the 70s and 80s and is still in effect today. On top of the BLAS, a number of linear algebra libraries were, were written, LinPack, LaPack, Scale LaPack, a whole slew of, of um, linear algebra applications. The large simulation programs, think uh, Department of Energy simulation programs, were built on top of these they could easily swap out the underlying hardware as long as the hardware vendors provided the BLAS library. We are doing the same thing in a community of uh, 19 or more uh, researchers. Uh, we've called the effort the graph BLAS effort. It's, it's a bit of a misnomer. It's not exactly linear algebra, but uh, let me give the obligatory math slide. So one of the members of that committee is Jeremy Kepner. He's been researching um, algebras, and he's coming out with a book on mathematics of big data next year, where he mapped out the space of, of algeb algebra properties. Um, if you, let's see, if you look at the small box here, it's uh, right there. That's the linear algebra box, which is what simulation programs are written on top of. Uh, for graph analytics, we actually use uh, a math that's somewhat relaxed from linear algebra. 
We don't uh, operate over fields. We don't have things like additive inverses, multiplicative inverses. Um, because of those relaxations, we ha or more are, have more freedom to swap out the operations that we use to operate on matrices and vectors. For instance, instead of multi multiplication and addition, we can do min <coughs> operations and plus operations. So as of the middle of September, the committees um, decided on nine primitive operations right now. The build matrix and extract tuples are the way to get data into and out of this library. The workhorse of this library is the matrix multiply, which is equivalent to a traversal, a single ply traversal through the graph. Um, we have the ability to do extract and assign of subgraphs, so you can pull subgraphs out and operate on them. You can modify subgraphs of an existing data, uh, existing graph. Uh, we have element-wise operations to modify edges and vertices, um, and three more. Apply, you know, arbitrary applies um, reduction operations, which is largely a convenience operation, and the transpose, which basically changes the direction of every edge in the graph. Um, I should state that the key primitive data type in this is the sparse matrix, which is the adjacency matrix for graphs. Um, and just a reminder, here's the graph again, the adjacency matrix is in the lower left. Um, in order to get performance on underlying hardware, it is these operations and the operations on this data type that need to be made most efficient for the underlying hardware. So you have graph analytics experts writing programs to the interface I just stated, uh, th this one. And you have hardware experts trying to figure out the best way to implement both sparse matrix data structures and the operations that we described before on them. Uh, one thing that we add to this effort is the development of a number of algorithms on this API. Uh, we're doing this to prove that the API is um, complete in some sense. We have a number of classes of algorithms. The, the first two traversals, such as breadth first search and shortest path, are common benchmark uh, algorithms. Uh, something that we found in our work in graph analytics at the center is clustering and community detection, especially for cybersecurity, computer network security. Um, and there are a number of other useful algorithms such as connected components, spanning tree, max flow, uh, page rank is useful in social network analysis, and a number of graph metrics. So at the beginning of November, we'll be releasing both an implementation of the uh, graph primitives tuned for GPU. Um, we have established an initial version of the API, that's the separation of concerns. And on top of that, we've built over a dozen algorithms. Um, not only will, be re will we be releasing the library, we'll actually be releasing an open source project that will continue to um, be modified as the committee uh, works through the specification. So let's look at some examples. Um, this may not seem like a big deal, but with, with the GraphLaws API, we've written a breadth first traversal just using five calls. Um, I'll have an example of code in a minute that is equivalent to that for a GPU. Um, the API is not fixed in stone yet. There is, for example, a debate about whether or not we should add masks to a matrix vector multiply. A uh, mask basically says, I only care about the results in certain subset of entries. Um, if you do add masks, this five call implementation can become a three call implementation. It's a matter of semantics. And there's, a, there's an argument about whether or not you want um, more atomic risk-like operations or more uh, complex instruction set types. 
uh, actually the hardware vendors and the compiler developers that are going to be compiling these programs down for hardware um, have um, something to say in this area. Uh, so a reminder, uh, we've done this for GPU, and this is actually code that we wrote um, at the beginning of this year, first six months of this year, for uh, a new class of NVIDIA hardware. Uh, these, these GPUs have uh, a new capability called dynamic parallelism. We're actually able to uh, implement breadth-first search using a compressed sparse row-like data structure uh, in 250 lines of code. Uh, that's pretty significant given that the best-in-class uh, implementation is on the order of 10,000 lines of code for GPU. Um, these are the performance results that we get with that 250,000, 250, 250 uh, lines of code. Our, our results are in orange. We peak out at over a billion edges traversed per second. So in breadth first traversal, I'm going from one node to all of its neighbors. Those, each one of those edges is an edge traversed. We can, we can uh, actually achieve a billion traversed edges per second up to a scale 19 graph. That is 2 to the 19th nodes. Um, the best in class in the blue there is that 10,000 plus lines of code GPU implementation uh, <coughs> written by uh, Dr. Merrill and run on the Lone Star uh, computer system down at Texas. Um, if you were here last year, these are the results that we had. Uh, in the lower left is the adjacency list implementation on a single CPU, less than a million traversed edges per second. Um, we took the CSR approach to GPU last year. We got an order of magnitude improvement, but uh, the x-axis across the bottom is a measure of code complexity normalized to the simple case. Uh, about 35% more code. Um, if we, or that's the single CPU compressed sparse row. If we go to GPU, GPU programming is still more complex, but we get yet another order of magnitude improvement. Um, the results that we just showed um, are close to another order of magnitude and more complexity. Uh, so you see as, as these systems get more complex, the code becomes more complex and the, um, the space to explore for efficient implementation is, is pretty high. Um, we've also looked at multi-CPU implementations. This is one particular library using a BLAS-like approach. One implementation gets you scaling from one CPU to 100. Um, the, the kicker is that the GPUs are only are less than $5,000. The 100-core, 128 128-core uh, CPU system is over $300,000. So future work. With the GraphBlas API in front of this, we get one implementation, like the, the five color or the three call. Um, we can hide all the complexity of these different implementations behind the API and perhaps even improve on them if we can leverage the expertise at the hardware vendors uh, and achieve uh, performance for very little code. Um, so we are going to continue working with the standardization committee. Uh, we are going to continue working on the C++ reference implementation. Uh, we are talking to collaborators both here at CMU and MIT Lincoln Labs. These both happen to be hardware designers who are interested in building uh, relevant applications on top of their hardware. Um, in the course of our algorithm development, we discovered that the API lacks some expressivity. Uh, basically, it boils down to we need sparse solvers. So there, there is an active area of research in developing algorithms with the API and finding out where the limits are. So we'll be looking into how to do sparse solvers either with the API or by extending the API. And thanks.